A few months ago I made a video about the basics of combat in Exalted 3rd Edition. In that video we talked about the structure of combat rounds, how to join combat and how initiative works. We also talked about withering and decisive attacks. This video is a continuation to that video where we delve deeper into the complexities of the combat system. There will be a few videos like this going forward, each one covering a different aspect of the system. In this particular video we'll talk about positioning and movement during combat. Exalted is an epic adventure game where combat is meant to be dynamic. When Exalts fight, they should race across rooftops, leap from branch to branch in primeval jungles, or rampage through stairs and halls in ancient manses. When compared to a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where combat movement is balanced around the use of grid maps, the dynamic nature of Exalted requires that the movement is left abstract. If you try to use grid maps for a game like Exalted, you take away from the dynamic feel of the game. Even though a combat scene is structured in rounds, turns and ticks, it's still a very narrative experience. To represent this dynamic and narrative experience, positioning in game is measured by general distances instead of exact distances. The general distances are called range bands, and they are usually the distance deemed dramatically appropriate by the storyteller within reason, of course. When two characters are within close range of each other, they are at each other's face, close enough to easily attack with hand-to-hand -hand weapons. But what is and isn't close may vary from weapon to weapon, character to character, and situation to situation. Two people brawling in a winehouse may be chest to chest or skull to skull as they wrestle each other on the floor, while only taking a few steps back would not necessarily constitute as close range any longer. In contrast, two soldiers fighting with spears on the battlefield may be advancing and retreating several feet away from each other, reading each other's movements and lunging forward when necessary. They may still be at close range, even if the brawlers wouldn't have called it such. At the same time, two exalts in, a, in an epic life or death fight with great dramatic and narrative impact could be standing 10 to 20 feet from each other at the start of their clash, then throw each other into a wall 10 yards away, and they never leave close range. Because the range band is abstract, the only thing the storyteller needs to keep in mind when determining characters' positioning is if the range bands they describe are consistent in relation to the opponents they fight. If a brawler and a spear fighter engage each other, they need to treat the range bands the same, even if they don't necessarily have to do so in relation to other opponents. For example, when a brawler and a spear wielder fight, they are both at close range, and if they back away from each other, they are both at short range. It isn't a situation where the brawler is at short range while the spear fighter remains at close. If this breaks immersion for some of you, think about it like this instead. They are in close range if they are currently engaging each other, and trying to leave that engagement could prove difficult or dangerous because the opponent could try to stop them the moment they try to retreat. When characters are outside the immediate reach of their opponents but close enough to engage after a quick sprint, they are at short range of each other. This is the optimal distance for most ranged attacks, since the opponent is close enough to shoot without the need of an aim action. Ranged attacks further away than short range usually require an aim action before the attack to not miss automatically. At the same time, a close range fighter can engage a short range fighter with a reflexive movement, so there's risk involved for a short range fighter to stay at short range as well. If characters are further away still from each other, they are at medium range. This is the maximum distance for far-reaching thrown weapons, and for some less powerful archer weapons. It's also no longer possible to communicate without shouting. Like I mentioned before, any ranged attacks from this distance require an aim action or it will automatically miss. An aim action is a combat action that normally adds additional dice to an attack, but at this distance allows the attack to be made at all. Ranged fighters can choose to make two aim actions before their attack in order to first allow the attack to be made and then add the normal aim bonus dice to it. It's not possible for a close combat fighter to engage an opponent at medium range with their reflexive movement alone. It's uh, therefore a secure position for a ranged fighter, say that their attacks become less frequent or less potent due to the required aim actions. The next range band is long range, where the characters are far enough away from each other to only be able to fight using powerful archer weapons such as sniping at each other with longbows. 
the characters are generally too far away to have any meaningful communication without the help of some kind of signaling device or magic. A close range fighter is at a clear disadvantage against an archer at long range since they are likely to get a few shots in before the other can close the distance. The final range band is extreme range, where the characters are distant specs or not visible at all. Anything beyond long range is considered extreme range regardless of distance, and both attacks and communication is generally impossible without involving some kind of magic. All combat scenes take place with these range bands in mind, and it's up to the players to determine how they want to position themselves in regards to each other. Some players may stay back at short or medium range, while others charge forward to get into close range. Some ranges may not be available at all depending on the overall scenery. When fighting in a cramped room, for example, everyone should be at close range, while the hallway outside of that room could be considered short range. Meanwhile, a battlefield may have archers back at long range, giving support to the cavalry charging towards close range. Even though the ranges themselves are abstract, a lot of tactics can involve them. However, in order to set up the positioning you want, the characters need to know how to move from range band to range band. This brings us to movement actions. Every character can, on their turn in combat, make a single movement action. This could be either a combat action or a reflexive action, depending on what type of movement it is, but it cannot be both at the same time. While it's encouraged to stunt movement, such as circling an enemy, vaulting over a table and so on, all of that should take place within a single range band in order to not prompt the movement action. And while flurries can combine two combat actions, they cannot combine two of the same combat actions. And while a rush action and a disengage action are both combat actions, they are both movement actions and therefore barred from being combined together in a flurry. The basic move action is a reflexive action, letting the character move a single range band without the need for a roll and without taking up their action for the turn. For example, if joint battle is rolled and two fighters stand at short range from each other, the character whose turn at is may use the reflexive move action to get into close range, then use their action to attack their opponent. There are situations when a character cannot take the reflexive move action, such as when grappled or when their movement is otherwise contested. If they are in difficult terrain, moving a single range band requires two movement actions, which basically forces them to use their move action this turn, then use it again the following turn, before finally reaching the next range band. The rush action is a combat action targeting a specific opponent within short range of the character. This may even be explicitly combined with a reflexive move action for free without it counting as a flurry, which basically means that you can use it even if you started your turn at medium range from your target, first reflexively moving to short range and then rushing towards the target at that range. The rushing character and the rush target both roll dexterity plus athletics. If the rusher is successful, then as soon as the target moves range band, the rusher will immediately and reflexively move the range band towards them, keeping the pace. This means that as soon as the target keeps moving, the rusher will automatically move with them, even outside of their own turn. I've noticed that a lot of players are confused about how rush actions interact with reflexive move actions. Keep in mind that a rush action doesn't involve a change of range bands within the turn itself. You cannot, on your turn, use a rush action in order to get from short to close range of an opponent. You could declare a move action to do that if you're at short range away at the start of your turn. The way it works is that you declare your rush action while remaining at short range. If your target failed their roll and decides to move away from you, your rush action allows you to automatically follow them a single range band outside of your own turn in combat. However, a rush action can be used after a reflexive move action, and it can only be used at short range. This means that if you really want to close the distance to a target, you must start your turn at medium range in order to reliably want to use a rush action. As you stand at medium range from your opponent, you use a reflexive move to get into short range and there declare a rush action. That's the end of your turn. When it's your opponent's turn, they may try to get away from you by making a move action out of medium range. This will automatically trigger your rush, moving you a range band towards them, even though it isn't your turn. When next it's your turn again, 
you're at short range from your opponent and can close the distance with a move action. The disengage action is a combat action that can only be used when your character is at close range of a hostile opponent and you want to retreat out of short range. You cannot use your reflexive move action to do so because you're engaged with an opponent. Instead, the disengage action allows you to attempt a retreat by making an opposed roll of dexterity plus dodge against the dexterity plus athletics of all opponents within close range who wish to contest the action. If your roll defeats all contesting rolls, you move out to short range. After having moved out to short range, if any opponent who failed to contest you try to use their own movement action to close the distance to you, you'll automatically retreat another range band from them without it counting as a movement action. This automatic movement functions similar to rush actions but in reverse and it only occurs the first time after your disengage action that the disengaged opponent moves towards you. If you instead failed your disengage attempt, you're stuck within close range and able to move range band this turn. Unlike a rush action, it costs two initiative to attempt a disengage action. You can even crush yourself by using a disengage action, though doing so will cause you to immediately lose another 5 initiative rather than rewarding someone else an initiative crash bonus. When a character is knocked to the ground, they are prone, preventing them from taking movement actions and penalizing their attack rolls and defense. A prone character must take the rise from prone action in order to get up on their feet. This is a combat action that's usually automatic but can be contested by a hostile opponent within close range. If the rise from prone is contested, the prone character rolls dexterity plus dodge against difficulty 2 to succeed. I personally think it's uh, unfortunate that the difficulty isn't determined by how well the opponent can contest the action, like with disengage actions. But being prone is generally more dangerous than simply being in close range, so a contesting role would likely impact the prone character in a very negative way, sometimes perhaps even making it impossible to get back up on your feet. For that reason the difficulty 2 is a fair ruling, but I'd suggest the contesting role as an alternative if you want to house rule a more gritty combat experience. A combat scene takes place in a location, and locations can contain scenery that may act as cover against attacks. The take cover action is a combat action that allows a character to seek cover from attackers by positioning themselves behind some part of the scenery, such as a tree or a rock. The player rolls dexterity plus dodge at a difficulty determined by the storyteller to see if they manage to take cover. The cover itself may be light, heavy or full. Light cover protects parts of the character's body such as leaning into a doorway or standing behind a waist-high wall and it increases defense by one. Heavy cover protects most of the character's body, usually only leaving a body part or two uncovered, and it increases defense by two. Full cover protects the character's entire body, making attacks impossible. When attacking a covered target from close range, both the attacker and the target benefit from the cover. Just like how range bands determine distances in an abstract way, what constitutes cover is also abstract. A character uses the take cover action to hide behind a tree should only be in cover from enemies on the other side of that tree. If they have enemies at their back, the cover shouldn't protect against them. Similarly, a target may use their own movement to try to bypass the cover and it's up to the storyteller's discretion to determine when the character is no longer in cover based on positioning or movement. In some situations, characters can also benefit from cover without having to take the take cover action, such as if they are in the woods with trees all around and someone tries to shoot at them from some distance away. Even without their trying, the trees in between them and the archer could provide some cover. The withdraw action is a combat action used to escape from the battlefield completely. It's an extended dexterity plus athletics roll with difficulty 1 and a goal number of 10 with an interval of 1 round. This means that you need to continue to roll every round until you reach a total of 10 threshold successes. In order to attempt this action, you must be at least at medium range from all other opponents. For each attempt, you move one range band away from your enemies while losing 10 initiative. If you succeed at the extended roll while at extreme range from all opponents, you successfully withdraw regardless of whether you meet the goal number or not. Having successfully withdrawn, you lose all pursuit as well. I mentioned difficult terrain earlier when describing the reflexive move action. This represents ungainly terrain such as thick snow or muddy swamps, 
but it can also be represented by some kind of blockading object that forces a detour, such as a tall fence or a small house. Any attempt to rush, disengage or withdraw across difficult terrain suffer a minus 3 penalty. When storytelling for Exalted and wanting to present an interesting combat scene, I think it's important to present scenery that encourages movement and positioning. The God's Chapel could contain stone pillars that the players can use as cover against enemy attacks. The bamboo forest make it easy for archers to hide, but the fleeing characters gain some cover against attacks thanks to the bamboo stalks. If the players flee from an abyssal and their henchmen, their retreat may take them into a muddy swamp, providing difficult terrain for when the abyssal catches up to them. These details help to make the scene more dramatic, but it also provides additional elements to keep track of. If you want a simple combat encounter, focus all on the range bands themselves so that you know which characters are engaged up close and which ones give ranged support. When you get uh, comfortable using range bands and the movement actions, you can start adding uh, details such as difficult terrain and natural cover to help make the scenes more dramatic. Exalted 3rd edition has a complex system and it's easy to get overwhelmed by all of these rules. The next time I'll make a video in this series, I'll talk about gambits. Hopefully you won't have to wait as long for that one. If you like this video and want to see more, make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. You may also support me by going to my Patreon, where I post frequent previews of my game Machineborn, as well as the manuscript for all of my scripted videos. There's a, there's a link in the description below for the manuscript to this one. I'm not entirely sure yet what the next video will be, but it's probably going to be the third part of my role-playing journal. And until then, see you in creation.